young Chicago family drives down to Park Forest, Illinois, for a look at a community that's as orderly and well-planned as their own big city is sprawling and confused. Park Forest was built here from scratch, starting in 1946. It was America's first fully planned community, built by private enterprise for returning World War II veterans, according to the Park Forest Historical Society's Jerry Schnee. The developers hoped to make a profit, of course, but they also had some idealistic notions about how to solve the severe housing shortage at the start of the baby boom. Developer Philip Klutznick was commissioner of federal public housing in the Truman administration. He said, we aren't interested in houses alone. We are trying to create a better life for our people. We will have failed if all we do is produce houses. Klutznick said he believed in living over the store. He moved into this unit with his wife and five kids in 1948 when Park Forest was brand new. The family stayed in Park Forest until 1961. Klutznick later lived above the store on North Michigan Avenue after he developed the swanky water tower place. Klutznick and his collaborators, businessman Carol F. Sweet, developer Nathan Manilow, and architect Gerald Lobel, designed a revolutionary community according to the most modern ideas about town planning. Klutznick said the completion of this town will mark one of the farthest reaching actions of private enterprise to replace the usual crowded second-rate urban existence with the American way of life. First came the apartment buildings with 3,000 rental units like this one, which has been restored and is being operated as a house museum by the Park Forest Historical Society. The townhomes were built in clusters. Each had a parking area at the center and a communal tot lot visible from every home. The development was full of child-friendly features like that. Next came 5,700 single-family homes built on super blocks, or park blocks, which were formed by winding streets containing open space and landscaping. It was the state of the art in 50s era town planning. There was a large regional shopping center called the Plaza. Its clock tower became a local landmark. Author William White wrote about Park Forest in the landmark book, The Organization Man. In his view, the planners were trying to create a classless society that valued conformity above all else. He called it inconspicuous consumption, and he saw something ominous in this idealistic vision. White described these junior executives and their families as transients on a journey up the new ladder of post-war corporate America. White argued residents were becoming so conditioned by their community and their corporate employers that they risked losing their individuality and leadership ability, remaining, in his words, perpetual children. But many park foresters bristle at that characterization even 50 years later. They point out that these young veterans and their wives built all the institutions of municipal government and social society and ran the town themselves while working full-time jobs and raising families. Maybe the most interesting thing about Park Forest is that for all its emphasis on conformity and fitting in, it officially supported open housing and integration from the very beginning. But that policy wasn't tested until 1960, when an African-American university professor named Charles Z. Wilson moved into this house with his wife and three kids. Village President Robert Dinnerstein made a promise to protect all citizens equally. Dinnerstein and other leaders met with neighbors to calm their fears. Property values won't go down, they said, if panic selling does not occur. Wilson and the handful of other African Americans who moved to Park Forest in the 1960s endured some verbal harassment, but on the whole they said their experience was positive and uneventful. Today, Park Forest's population is about 40% minority, 35% African American, according to census figures. And it's widely viewed as the best example of a stable, integrated suburb in the whole Chicago area. South suburban leaders are working hard to encourage this kind of success all over the region. The Unity Coalition, formed in the 1990s, holds an annual event called Hands Across the Southland, a sort of an affirmation of their faith in diversity. 
And each year, dozens of residents host diversity dinners, welcoming each other into their homes. Park Forest's Human Relations Director Barbara Moore says the town is debunking myths and fears about racial integration with good schools, low crime rates, and cultural attractions like a professional orchestra and theater and a visual arts center. The iconic post-war era shopping center has been replaced with a more traditional downtown area with new streets and small storefronts. Larry McClellan, who is white and who has lived and worked in nearby University Park for 30 years, told me that the greatest gift he gave his children was to raise them in an integrated community. That's why people like Larry wouldn't live anywhere else. Of all the big dreams and grand ideas we've seen on this journey through the region south of Chicago, perhaps this humble notion of living together in harmony is really the biggest dream of all.